Welcome to This Week in Common Sense for the second week of September 2020, Part 2. Titanic hits ice cream. This is really two stories melded together, melted together. <laughs> um, the first one is, of course, and I don't know if people have seen this. Surely they have, but uh, and I'll stop calling them surely. But uh, Nancy Pelosi did a TV bit with somebody, one of the late night hosts, I think. But eating ice cream, you know, how she was spending her time in the pandemic. And it shows her eating ice cream. She loves ice cream. Sometimes she has it for breakfast. Hey, it's a free country. And standing behind these two just beautiful, big uh, silver door refrigerator freezers, you know, just really nice stuff. Probably 20, 30,000, maybe more right there. But then she has all these gourmet ice creams and so on. So it was a very easy uh, Trump campaign, I think, did an ad on it. You know, this is uh, uh, Nancy Antoinette, you know, uh, and and let them eat ice cream. But it's it's interesting because, of course, then Nancy Pelosi was caught. Not only does maybe her wealth and her position give her a little bit different life than the average person, but also her position gives her the ability to break the rules because she says she was set up. But we all know that she went to uh, a salon to get her hair done. That was against the rules. You're not supposed to do that. Was she unaware? She's not aware of what the rules are. Is she not paying attention to the coronavirus? Or did she decide her hair was important enough she would just kind of skip the rules and get around them? And who's the wiser? And then, of course, when she gets caught, it's all a setup. But what's interesting to me is that it wasn't just Nancy Pelosi flouting these rules. It's all of San Francisco. The government in San Francisco has their own gyms for lawyers and bailiffs and people at the courthouses and so on and so on. The police have their gyms and so on. And all of the private gyms have been shut down this whole time and are still shut down. And yet it comes out that the government employees, who are, of course, a... Uh, everybody's equal, but they're more equal than we are. Um, they don't have to shut down their exercise facilities. So it's, it's um, you know, it, again, it's the, it's the age old do as I say, not as I do. And in any society where government regulates everything and controls everything, well, you're going to have the people who have connections to the people who are high up in that government you had it in the Soviet Union. You've got it in San Francisco. You've got it everywhere that government exists. And the question is, how much of it do you have? But the more government controls, the more the society is controlled by who has access to power and not who makes the best products or who works the hardest or who hits the most home runs or what have you. So uh, that's that's Titanic hits ice cream. Yeah, but it also shows that they don't really believe that the pandemic is as bad as they say it is. To me, this is just so obvious. They don't believe what they're telling us. It's not just that they don't do as they tell us. They don't believe what they tell us. I don't believe that they believe it. No, they don't believe it, Tim, because they don't believe. And and I'm not, I'm not doing some religious thing here. Um, well, that may be true, too. I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm 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 not suggesting that they aren't believers, and I don't I don't think that if you're a believer or not a believer that that I believe one and don't believe the other. Boy, how's that for using believe a lot of different ways? They aren't about hey, this is what truth is, and this is what I believe, and come hell or high water, this is right, and therefore this is what I'm going on TV today to say what I believe. That's not what they do. They're going on TV today to say this because it's poll tested, because we need to push this issue, because this, because of that. It just never gets, it never gets to, do you believe that? Is that what you believe? These are not, these are not phrases and thought patterns that go on in Washington. So, of course, 
the fear that they're spreading, they don't know whether they sh- it's right or wrong or who, what matters. Everything's just perception. Perception is reality. It's one of the phrases I hear all the time in Washington. Perception is reality. <clears throat> no, it's not. But if you don't care what reality is, if you're just completely dis, you know, just not that concerned, then you really just care what the perception is, because that's how that's what the parameters are on what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. And this is how they think. So they're spreading fear, not because they have any belief that this is actually scary, but because they've seen polls that say it's scary. And because it undercuts their opponent, if the world is terrible, if things are worse than they were four years ago, if you have all these fears and the world is coming apart, it's what they tried to do with the riots that are happening in democratic cities that they're sort of supporting. And then all of a sudden, because they're supporting the protests, but then they can't seem to make any differentiation between the protests and the riots. Was that tough for you, for me? No but very tough for them and for the media, for much of it. And so, you know, that, that's the, that, that seems to be the, um, you know, the, the idea, if this hurts Trump, let's go hog wild. Let's rip the country apart. If that shows people that they shouldn't vote for Trump, does the country need to be ripped apart? And not important to even consider that. Do I believe that this is a serious enough threat that I need to whip up these fears? Never even consider that. That's not important. Will it be effective in hurting Trump? That's what they're going to want to know. And frankly, the Republicans are going to want to, you know, on the issues are going to want to, does this hurt Biden? The, the politicians and the people around them in Washington, that is how they think. And, and frankly, you know, it's 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 not they're not the only people in the world who cut corners and just care about, you know, what's good for them. But it's such a reinforcing culture of that, I think, in Washington, that it's, you know, way beyond what it is for most people in terms of excusing bad behavior and never even considering the consequences, uh, consequences of their actions. Now, you're and speaking. Ne- Speaking of consequences on actions, you were going to do it. Should I just step back, Tim, and let no, you actually go? Go talk? ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I believe it's your show, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse. The next day, we talked about the foam rubber bullet and, uh, and consequences. And I have to say, there's kind of a weird graphic, which on the podcast, uh, you'll see it on, on YouTube, but... Uh, at SoundCloud and some of the other places where you get the audio, you got to go to thisiscommonsense.org to see this. It's a big, fuzzy, blurry sign, black, with white letters that say obey. And what this commentary is about is a boy. What is he, uh, 11 years old, 8 years old? I, I thought it I was said. 10, but I, we didn't. I don't think it's in the piece. I don't think it's in there. I don't think no, it is. But no. he was just somewhere around that. It's Isaiah Elliott. And he's in a Zoom chat in school. That's that's how school's going. And, uh, and so he's in a Zoom chat. And he has a Nerf gun. One of these Nerf guns that shoots the little neon green Nerf balls or bullets or whatever i guess it's a bullet but but of course if it hits you in fact even if it probably hits you in the eye you're probably just fine but you know i'm not advising people to shoot nerf guns into people's eyes just for the record so they see him on the zoom education you know uh uh, conference his teacher sees that he's got this nerf gun uh, and he didn't have it the whole time. He had it for a little bit of time. Well, she goes to the administration. He's, he's suspended. And, you know, this family, unlike so many others, doesn't seem to bitch and moan about it. They take their kid out of school and they put him in a different school. And the beauty is he gets to keep playing with that Nerf gun as he should. Uh, 
but it's just you know it's just amazing and and you know we've done so many of these through the years uh, my favorite was the uh, toast that was carved in the shape of a gun and the kid was suspended from school that was my favorite <laughs> I, I don't think i've ever gotten over that one i thought the the a student who brought a knife to cut her apple not a sharp knife but just a table knife and was suspended that was i thought that was one of the worst uh, I used to, you know, there was also the kid who drew the pictures of some battle with people shooting back and forth. I used to draw those pictures all the time. I didn't even know I was, you know, a wannabe terrorist or something. But um, but the way our society flips out about this is is just, you know, let's keep being aware of it. Um, someday, hopefully, we will live in a society where people don't flip out about this and you know, I say about police so often that I think every uh, police officer before he goes on the beat uh, audit logged like 100 hours of the Andy Griffith show um, <laughs> because Andy Griffith had a sense for how you police in a respectful manner and how you don't make mountains out of mohills. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that'd be great. Well, here's kind of the same thing. It's like we need, you know, uh, uh, what was it? Leave it to Beaver. Who was the teacher? I can't think of her name, but she was uh, she was a wonderful teacher. Very cute. And um, especially for, you know, eight year old boys. And um, anyway, Mrs. Landers, I think it's Mrs. Landers. But, you know, you need a teacher who has some sense that really, do you need to report the Nerf gun to the administration? Does the administration, wouldn't the administration say, well, why don't we call the parents and call them and say, hey, um, we really, you know, we, we're afraid people will flip out, not us, but other people. No, they they suspend this kid. So he's got some permanent record on his permanent record. You know, it's like uh, it, it's ridiculous. And the 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 silver lining, the happy ending to this story is that this kid's in a better school today, that his parents took action against what they saw as insanity in a way that got their kid out of the insanity. Um, and I think that's great. And then speaking of insanity, we go to Disney's Mickey Mouse boycott policies, which is insanity or perhaps something even worse. And, and what we're talking about is Disney has the movie Mulan out. It's just live action, you know, off of the animated Disney feature years ago. And it's about a woman in China who fights like a man and, you know, wants to help defend her country and becomes a big hero and so on and so on. So very heroic story. And I, this is now the third reason that I've heard for people boycotting the, the movie. The first reason I heard was that the star of this uh, film and, and somebody else in the film as well have both made anti-Hong Kong protest comments and pro-Hong Kong police comments. Well, <laughs> that's enough to get me not to go to Milan. I don't think I was the target audience anyway, but, but I'm not going. I'm not doing anything with it. I'm not a big fan of Disney for, for that uh, film and for those what they said uh, not that I'm big on let's boycott everything but but I think what's happening in Hong Kong is pretty serious stuff and and there's a right side and a wrong side but then I also heard that there are no Asians in there are Asians in the acting cast but there are no Asians in the crew or in the uh, promotion, ac promotional activities or so on and so on in the writers or so uh, there were people who are uh, boycotting it for that reason. And then, of course, it comes out that in the credits to the movie, Disney thanks the propaganda arm of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party uh, in the and I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, the publicity department of the CPC, that's the Chinese uh, Communist Party, Communist Party of China, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomy Region Committee, 
So basically, Disney was able to film very close to where the concentration camps are. So they thanked the people who run those concentration camps. And in this particular commentary, just to give people a maybe a little different angle on it, I compared the state of Georgia, not Georgia, you know, that that uh, country borders Russia, but our Georgia, you know, next to uh, north of Florida and, and east of Alabama. Disney, I compared Georgia with China. Disney had threatened not to do any business in Georgia because in the state of Georgia, they passed a law that said if a heartbeat is found in a fetus, in an unborn child, that you cannot do an abortion. Now, that's a pretty serious restriction as as restrictions go on abortion around the country. People disagree, agree. Um, but somehow that doesn't quite reach the same thing as having concentration camps with a million plus Uyghurs where you are actively browbeating and torturing has been alleged and people go missing and you want them to cease their religious activity and cease speaking their language and cease being a Uyghur and do whatever the Mandarin Chinese uh, language, what the rest of you know the majority of Chinese folks do, the way they talk and act and so on. This is <clears throat> it's ethnic cleansing. Um, well, that's what it is, ethnic cleansing. And, you know, we, we don't know that they're killing scores of people, but there have been some people who have been killed and there have been people who have been imprisoned and there have been people who have been tortured. And for Disney to somehow be hypersensitive to the abortion issue in the United States and have no clue about what's going on in China, how, how does that work? Where, who, do, are, do these people not read newspapers? Are they in like hermetically sealed little vaults and they just go to work at Disney and then return to these? How do you make that where you're ready to boycott the state of Georgia in a heartbeat? How do you like that? Uh, but not boycott China for installing modern day concentration camps with frankly the same basic purpose as the as the holocaust concentration camps of the last century it's it's well it's just it's despicable it's blindness in a way that's uh well i'd hate to be that blind and i'd hate to think that somebody could see this and still behave that way the second reason you had to boycott, that you'd heard to boycott the uh, uh, show, was uh, because of lack of diversity. Uh, but this same week, the big story from Hollywood was that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences came out with new rules that to qualify as the best picture, they had to have a diverse cast and crew. So... China is literally anti-diversity by ragging on a, on a minority population, and Disney is thanking the concentration camps, you're saying. That's an astounding thing, by the way. It's hard to even yes. imagine. And, and meanwhile, Hollywood is fawning all over itself to be more diverse. You get the idea that maybe show is more important than substance in the Hollywood folks. Well, and, and, and look at, I mean, look at what they're doing to this Muslim population that seems to get missed, but you know, in in the United States, any sort of you know, <clears throat> even looking at certain countries and and the way uh, uh, Trump announced his uh, you know Muslim ban on immigration was one hundred and ten percent wrong. Um, you cannot ban people because of their religion in in the United States, uh, but. At the same time, 
to ban from certain countries when there are bad things happening and so on. It was all played up as this anti-Muslim sentiment. And yet then they miss when there's huge anti-Muslim sentiment that is real anti-Muslim sentiment, not just concern about, you know, countries that are falling apart and that might export terrorists in, in sort of the same way that, that, uh, Oh, I'm going to lose my train of thought on that, but um, can't win them all. But we should go to our last one because we're this is maybe the longest ever podcast, just because I went on that long rant. Our last commentary of the week is the obvious itch. And, you know, we talked about this, Tim, and it, it I wonder if other people are talking about it as much. I see some stuff on social media, but this is all heading to a vaccine on the on COVID-19. And they're putting one together as fast as they can for all the right reasons and probably a few wrong ones, too. But the question is, is that vaccine going to be forced upon every man, woman and child in the United States of America? And in this this script, I'm really pushing the idea that these people are not very trustworthy because these people have put us in tremendous danger from a fiscal standpoint, which completely gets forgotten. The Republicans don't care about fiscal uh, issues anymore. The Democrats never did. Uh, we're just spending money like crazy. We've spent, what, three, four, well, I'm sure we'll find out it's more like six or eight trillion dollars through this uh, pandemic. Money we didn't have, money that no one's even bothered to ask, how are we coming up with it? Are we ever gonna have to like tighten our belts later? Uh, or can we just splurge trillions whenever, you know, something bad happens? Um, and so I, I really push the whole idea that that we're completely um, unreasonable and unsafe in the way that we are running our government uh, in a way that is, I think, going to be disastrous if it isn't rectified and probably is going to be kind of painful even to rectify. And if these people don't care enough to be honest and to do right on those things, do we really think we want them to tell us uh, that we all have to do what they say when it comes to the mess of this pandemic? But I think in coming days, we'll address to some degree my view that whether this is a wonderful vaccine or a not so wonderful vaccine, frankly, you don't generally know until after a bunch of people have taken it. And uh, my wife and I, with our kids, you know, they were vaccinated. Now we, we slowed down the process. I think there was a vaccine or two that my wife didn't have them get. It may have been, uh, I could be off on that. Uh, she's the expert, not me. Um, but we were careful, but we wanted them to be vaccinated at the same time. And, and I've looked at some of the different articles. I don't, you know, I tend to not have any affirmative belief that vaccines are horrible for you. But I also have a belief that we don't force people to inject things into their bodies that they don't want to. And frankly, there is a society out there where private businesses may say in the future, you know, I, I raised the possibility in this script that, uh, folks may be blocked from taking their kids to school or going to church or going to the restaurant or where have you or the stadium for a ball game or whatever if they can't show that somehow they took the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> private people can take all kinds of actions. Uh, your private uh, summer camp may say if you don't have the vaccine, you can't come. I don't think that that's, you know, that that can be stopped uh, or should be. But I don't like the idea of the government telling people they have to engage in a medical procedure at any time for any reason. And I don't think it's necessary. I think almost everyone's going to do it, that we can persuade people, that we can respect their freedom and persuade them instead of disrespecting their freedom and ordering them to, because frankly, We'll continue to tear our society apart if we force a vaccine on every man, woman, and child, including those who will resist 
the vaccine. Well, my uh, point of view is exactly yours except for one thing, and that is Bill Gates has specified what he's doing in the vaccine that they're preparing, and I don't want anything to do with what his agenda is. It's peculiar. I don't trust him as far as I can throw my Apple computer. I would never use Windows, and I'm never going to ever take a vaccine that anything <laughs> anything that Bill Gates has touched. Uh, I think he may be the most evil person in a big business in our lifetime, and uh, Putin has just come out and said that they will not participate with any uh, United Nations, any universal vaccine. They have their own, and they're going ahead with their own. They're resisting completely, and they will not do it. And this is a very interesting and amusing moment in uh, in world history. I believe his use of, he used the word Marxist to describe uh, the, the process going on in the in the, in the so called free world. Are you serious? I, I'll try to I'll try to look at it. It may be the t- just the title that somebody imposed on it. I just saw it b- before we went oh, online. Wait, wait. I just saw it. And Let me know. Let me know. Putin, Let's... how awful he may be. He's very much like Trump. He has entertainment value, and they also <laughs> like Trump. He doesn't do what the um, elites want him to do. You know, the the world elites. He does things that his own way, and uh, you know. Countervailing powers. I'd rather have a countervailing power uh, against really evil people, like in China. Obviously, China is worse than Russia. More powerful. I'm not sure. Um, smarter and more powerful. Much more powerful. Yeah. Uh, but but I think the same same trustworthiness, which is zero. Well, Putin, negative, li- a Putin likes number. to kill people, and he's taking over the. He's a he's a warlord. I mean, he's an old fashioned warlord, and they're he's a much more of a thug. Than, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're much slicker. Xi Jinping is much slicker, I think, well, than Putin. But 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 when you think about it, both of them are terrible actors, and I I um, I sometimes marvel at how like I thought, well, you know, I'm so worried about China today, and I worry about Russia too because they're just a bad actor. Um, but but Russia, I don't see them with the economic might to really do as much damage as China. And of course, most of my life, you know, communist China was, you know, they were starving lots of people, and you know, there's a hundred million uh, deaths on the CCP's hands uh, for the 20th century, uh, according to I think some pretty credible uh, sources. Um, but they weren't powerful enough to be much of a th- they're so poor they they weren't much of a threat to their neighbors uh who uh, maybe tibet uh they were a threat but they would they weren't the sort of worldwide threat that russia was at that time and even russia i think was always overstated as you know the level of their military and so on i, I always thought they were a paper tiger and i think i think it was right in in the sense that they couldn't have sustained a long thing they're they just they just didn't have the same kind of economy. China has a economy that can sustain a lot of things, and and so it's a much scarier uh, deal because most of my life I've been more worried about the bad things my own government might do because it was much more capable uh, of good and bad uh, around the world, and I still worry very very much about the bad that our government can do around the world. I do see some good, but I think so much of the good has to be not, I I do not want to see the American empire continue the way it is. I think that the only, the only reason to be engaged in foreign policy is to allow trade to make us wealthier and to allow freedom and free people to help defend each other. And the American people can always choose that we want to go it alone. But I think a lot of folks around the world would likely say, hey, why don't we be together? Because you guys are big and strong, and it will help us stay free. And the truth is, I think we can leverage that support from free other free countries so that we aren't the only people doing stuff and so that we are more secure and the world is more secure and you know we are not spending all the money in europe and spending all the money in asia we've got real partners 
I think that that is because I've always I've always looked at how do you disengage as the world superpower, which I gosh, I hate that term because it's it's BS. We're not a superpower. We're a power like other powers. We may be bigger, but we're not somehow super. And uh, I mean, that's that's kind of uh, that's that's the kind of hubris that that you don't want to hang around. And uh, but I, it seems to me that um, we we have to find a way to move from world superpower, world policemen, which is just not sustainable to something better for us and frankly, something better for the world. And part of that is what Trump has done to try to get Europe to do more. But I would say to, to Germany, if I were president, what are you doing with this gas deal with Russia? We're spending, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars over time to defend against the threat from Russia and you're going to give them control of your energy? I mean, does that make any sense? And there are things like that to where the American people shouldn't be carrying all the load we should be good partners. And, and I think that that's possible. And, and obviously, at some point, it may be possible that we don't need alliances to, I mean, at a certain point, I'm not sure we need NATO anymore. Uh, you know, maybe Russia would, would uh, you know, roll tanks into Poland and so on if we didn't have it. But I think we have to constantly look at how do we disengage from a lot of these commitments that don't make sense. At the same time, you can't just turn it off uh, at a, the drop of a switch, or you would, I think, hand a lot of the world to Russia and to China. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, and you're talking about millions of people who, like I look at Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong's, what, seven and a half million, I think. Uh, but it's seven and a half million people who, you know, had a pretty wonderful free existence and Hong Kong didn't have the kind of democratic rights, political rights it should have had, but it had certain free speech rights and now they're gone. And now they're living under, under, you know, totalitarianism pretty darn close. And, uh, and I don't want that. I, I, I think you have certain principles you want to, you want to try to avoid uh, entangling alliances but I, I like the idea of having an alliance of free people, and I think it works to our advantage if we, the American people, have some control of our government. Frankly, if we have no control, which seems to be the case uh, way too much of the time, then, it, you know, then, then we're not going to have an alliance of free societies because our society isn't as free as it should be. And because I can tell you that the political class, the politicians are going to hear from people who want to make money in China. That's who's concerned about it. You and I, who are worried about the power of China but don't have any money to be made in China, we're not talking to congressmen about China. And that has to change, and it's starting to, which is why I think political things are moving. But, um, but anyway, that's, we need a foreign policy that is more controlled by the American people who I think have always wanted to put freedom at the top. And that's not, not to invade new countries and force freedom on them, but a defensive coalition against totalitarians like China, thugs like Russia. Uh, that makes sense to me. Well, with that, I think we could probably close the episode. Uh, we're at I least, think we better. We're at least at an hour and a half. And that would uh, be a new record for This Week in Common Sense, starring you, Paul Jacob. Maybe I won't even put an introduction at the beginning. It's getting so tight. So people will just have to wade through to the end to get the uh, citation. But we should mention once more This Week in Common Sense. Points to thisiscommonsense.org. That's what we're talking about as you're talking about the pieces you uh, publish five days a week on thisiscommonsense.org. And the podcast is available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. Apple and Google, and who knows what else. <laughs> Someday soon, Spotify. Someday yeah, soon. Yeah, if Spotify. you ever can find your account, eh? <laughs> I, I have it. I have to. I'm, I have to do that. All right, let's okay. do it. Uh, okay. We'll have a free country and a free peaceful world by next week, and and we'll comment on that. Well, that would certainly be a novelty. Okay. It would. Good night. Thanks, ma'am. Bye.